Chapter Ten of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Chapter Ten: The Tiger Hunt. All the way across the fields to the village, Biff was brimming with excitement because he had met Barma Shah, the secret agent mentioned by Divan Chand and the all-important contact to Biff's father. But Biff's enthusiasm was marred by disappointment. "'If only I'd told him who I was!' he exclaimed. "'All the while I was driving the jeep. I was holding back on that, thinking that to say anything to anybody might be giving ourselves away.' "'Barma Shah is very smart,' reminded Chandra. "'Perhaps he knew who you were.' "'What makes you think that, Chandra?' We kept seeing Jeep over and over. It went past us. We went past it, as if it was keeping watch on us. But that was due to all the traffic. Traffic did not hold us up after Sahib Shah let you drive his Jeep. Next thing, we were practically here at Supari. You may be right, Chandra, Biff agreed. They had reached the actual village now, a mass of closely built huts with mud walls and tiled roofs, surrounded by yapping nondescript dogs. It was almost sundown, and from this central point the fields and trees looked dark and gaunt against the spreading purple of the sky. Now people, mostly in native costumes, were flocking out, first in alarm, then in a wild welcome when they recognised Chandra. Biff and Kamuka were included in the villagers' enthusiasm, and then Chandra's uncle, the Patwari, was greeting them and introducing them, in turn, to the Patel, or head man of the village. The boys were supplied with cups of rich, delicious milk, and later they were taken to a modern building that served as school and community house, a symbol of the new India. There they feasted on tasty curry and rice, followed by fruits and cakes. Chandra, meanwhile, kept up a running chatter with his uncle and other villagers, mixing English with Hindi and the local native dialect. From the tone of the talk, Biff and Kamuka gathered that something quite serious was afoot. Chandra finally supplied the details. You will meet Varma Shah very soon, Chandra told Biff, because my uncle tells me that the head shikari at Kiwal has asked the village people to help trap a tiger tomorrow night. Aren't tigers usually hunted in the daytime? Not this kind, declared Chandra. The tiger is a cattle stealer, and lately he has prowled near the village, killing people after dark. That is why there is so much excitement when we arrive, close to nightfall. As they left the community house, Biff heard the incessant barking of the dogs on the fringe of the town. Watchmen with big spears were on patrol. Many lanterns were aglow, showing that the village was tense and alert. Wisps of greyish smoke coiled from the chimneys and wavered like fading ghosts against the vast blackness of the starlit sky. But when they entered the snug hut, which Chandra smilingly termed their Dulat Khana, or palace, Biff felt that the outside world was far away. His bed was a simple charpoy, tape strung to its frame instead of springs or mattress. But Biff was so tired that nothing could have been more comfortable. The calls of the patrolling watchman, the distant barking of the dogs, simply lulled him off to solid sleep. It was nearly noon when Biff awoke. He and Kamuka followed Chandra around the village, where they saw weavers, shoemakers, carpenters and blacksmiths at work. Chandra explained that they were paid off in crops raised by the farmers who made up most of the community. But today the carpenters and metal workers were combining their efforts in constructing huge wooden frames that were set with heavy bars of iron. Why, that looks like a big portable cage, Biff exclaimed. Chandra's uncle, the Patwari, was standing by. He smiled and responded, It is exactly that. Tonight we use it to trap the killer tiger. You mean he may walk right into it? No, no, the Patwari shook his head. The bars are to keep the tiger out, so the living bait will be safe inside the cage. But don't you just stake out some animal, asked Biff, so the tiger will think it is loose? Usually we do that with a pig or buffalo, replied Chandra's uncle. But this tiger has tasted human blood, so tonight we would try human bait. That is the purpose of the cage. 
And the bait, put in Chandra proudly, will be Kamuka and myself. We are going in with Thakka, the head watchman and chief hunter of the village. We are sorry to leave you out, Biff, added Kamuka in explanation. You were still asleep when they asked us, and it was only after we said yes that we found they had only room for two. Biff thought at first that his friends were joking, but it turned out they were quite in earnest. The cage had been specially designed for Thakur and two lookouts, preferably boys. But the village youths had become so tiger-conscious that they were seeing jungle cats every time a leaf stirred in the underbrush. So Chandra and Kamuka had been recruited for the job instead. Biff put on a show of disappointment, if only to impress Chandra's uncle and the other villagers. Maybe Barma Shah, the man with the jeep, will want me to help him, Biff said. I'll ask him when I see him. Late in the afternoon, the barred frames were ready and they were hauled by ox cart to a shola, or patch of jungle not far from the town. That was where the tiger had attacked and slain its victims, so the villagers had shunned the place for the past few days. During that period, Matapar, the head shikari from Kiwal, had put up platforms in surrounding trees, covering the open area where the tiger liked to prowl, by now he hoped the tiger would be used to it, but the cage idea did not appeal to Matapar. That had been thought up by Thakur, the village huntsman. So Matapar and the other shikaras watched silently, almost glumly, while Thakur and his helpers set up the cage close to a thicket that they thought would be inviting to the tiger. They were fixing the frames together with crude bolts. When Barma Shah drove up in his jeep, wearing his pulled-down beret and dark sunglasses. Biff walked over to meet him, and as Barma Shah nodded a greeting, Biff announced, I am Biff Brewster. I was sure of that, rejoined Barma Shah, extending his hand in greeting. But because of your mission, I thought it best to introduce myself first and let you make the next move. I'm doing that now, stated Biff. Sir, what have you heard from my father? Where is he? Despite himself, Biff betrayed anxiety in his tone. Barma Shah noticed it and put reassurance into his reply. I haven't heard from him, he said, but I know that he went to Kashmir and that he has probably gone on from there. His mission was there. Mine was in Calcutta. Barma Shah paused and glanced about to make sure that no one was close enough to hear. Then he inquired, Do you have the ruby Daiwan Chan gave you? Biff? fingered the bag beneath his shirt collar and nodded. Right here, he said. Good, your father will be needing it. We can talk more of this tomorrow. Barma Shah was carrying a modern rifle with what appeared to be a large telescopic sight mounted on top of the barrel. That reminded Biff of an important request. The other boys are going into the cage with Thakur, he stated. Could you post me on a platform or somewhere, sir? Barma Shah paused a moment, then nodded. I have the perfect job for you. I need a driver for this jeep, which I am keeping in reserve with two shikaris, in case anything goes wrong. By turning it over to you, I can post myself on one of the platforms. By sundown, the scene was set. Thakur was in the cage, gripping a big shotgun, and flanked by Chandra and Kamuka, each armed with a spear. Barma Shah had picked himself a platform up in a tree. Matapar and other shikaras were up on their platforms, all at ideal range. Biff was as far off in the jeep as space would allow, down at the end of a long, smooth gully that practically formed a roadway to the clearing. In the back seat, two more shikaris sat ready with their rifles. But as dusk gathered, tension grew. The cage was the focal point. If the tiger approached too close, Thakur was to drive him back with quick shots. Then Varma Shah, Matapar and the rest would open fire with their rifles, covering practically the entire clearing. Biff's job was to come up with the jeep only when needed, early if anything went badly wrong, later if it all went well. From the way things had been planned, they seemed likely to go well, but that depended partly on the tiger. Usually he picked his victims just before dark, but this evening he was wary. Chandra and Kamuka gave occasional calls, putting a frightened tremolo into their voices, hoping to coax the striped terror into seeking them. But the darkness thickened and then became almost total in the clearing before the cunning cat decided to strike. 
Then it happened, like the surge of an invisible fury. Sharp-eyed though they were, neither Chandra nor Kamuka caught the slightest glimpse of the 500-pound tiger until its ten feet of furred lightning landed squarely on the cage with the destructive force of a living thunderbolt. The cage buckled, hurtling the occupants on their backs. Thakur's shotgun spouted straight upward, missing the tiger entirely, as the creature, somewhat jolted, recoiled to the ground in front. Thakur, coming to his knees, aimed at the spot where the tiger crouched, but as he fired the second barrel, the third fury made another high, hard spring, clearing the path of aim. Again the cage was jarred, and now Thakur, desperate, grabbed a spear from Chandra and jabbed wildly through the bars, blindly trying to drive off the snarling killer, that he could not see. Given time, Thakur might have made a telling thrust, but meanwhile the tiger threatened to maul the cage apart. The framework was splintering under the fierce stroke of its claws. With each new spring, the iron bars were loosened. Varma Shah and the others on the platforms could not open fire with their rifles, for Thakur, so far, had failed to drive the tiger back. In the darkness, their shots would be more likely to hit Thakur or the boys. The clanging echoes carried far down the gully, where Biff was puzzled by the lack of rifle fire, but not for long. Biff realized what must be going on when the clashing sounds continued, and so did the men in back. Their grunts practically said, get going, as did the clicks from their rifles when they released the safety catches. Biff got going, as he had been told to do in such an emergency. He gunned the jeep into life, shot it straight up the gully, guiding by the outline of the clearing against the starry sky. The speeding jeep wallowed in the gully's slopes, then reached the open ground as Biff clicked on the lights and jammed the brakes. The sudden glare outlined the whole front of the cage, showing the tiger turning, snarling at the sound of the jeep's approaching roar. Briefly, the tiger was blinded and helpless, giving the men in the jeep their opportunity. They sprang out, dodged over toward the brush, and opened fire. One shot grazed the tiger, another clipped him, as he bounded away from the cage, spun in the air, and sprawled beyond the light. The shikaris from the jeep started over to examine their prize, but paused when warning shots came from both the cage and tree platforms. Half stunned, the tiger picked itself up, snarled at the two shikaris as they dived away from the light. Then the tiger itself took to the darkness on the other side, but not in flight. It had another purpose. It wanted to claw, to rip apart its real tormentor, the thing with the blazing eyes that had interrupted the tiger's efforts to reach its caged prey. That thing was the jeep. In the darkness, the wounded tiger turned suddenly upon it. Biff raised a shout as he heard an approaching snarl. The jeep heaved upward, sideward as the tiger's bolt hit it between hood and windshield. In the dim glow from the dashlight, Biff could see the monstrous clawing shape of the man-killer as it gathered itself for a final spring upon the new prey it had so unexpectedly found. Through Biff's stunned mind ran the freakish notion that whatever luck the light of the llama had brought him, the ruby's charm had lost its power by now. End of chapter 10 Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Chapter 11 of Mystery of the Ambush in India. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Chapter 11 A Thief in the Night. In their half-wrecked cage, Chandra and Kamuka realized all too thoroughly how the prospect of sure death had switched from them to Biff. After their experience, his frantic shout told them everything. It was pitch dark in back of the jeep's headlights. The marksmen in the trees couldn't even guess the tiger's location, let alone stop it with a chance shot. But it wasn't a chance shot that came. From one of the platforms, a sharp beam of light cut a thin path through the blackness, turning a brilliant spotlight on the open jaws and glittering eyes of the great beast that was already mashing the jeep's windshield with its mammoth paw. That sudden shaft of life was a bull's-eye in itself. Now, if a rifle muzzle could only score an identical hit, 
As that hope sprang to the boys who watched from the cage, it was answered in a realistic way. A rifle crackled, the tiger's big head jolted back, and its snarl broke. Biff saw that happen as he looked up from behind the wheel. Now the tiny circle of light was focused just behind the tiger's ear. Again the rifle spoke. The tiger's whole body came forward, but not in a lunge. Instead, its quarter ton of dead weight landed across the jeep's hood, crushing it down upon the motor. Then the striped body rolled to the ground, where the sharp beam picked it out again, probing it from head to tail. No further shots were necessary. Biff came up shakily behind the wheel, found that the jeep would still run, and backed it so the headlight shone full on the tiger. The creature not only was motionless, its odd, distorted pose proved that life had left it. Barma Shah came down from his platform, bringing the rifle with the thing that looked like a telescopic sight above the barrel. Only it wasn't a telescopic sight. It was a special flashlight powered by multiple batteries and focused down to almost a needle beam. I knew I might need this, declared Barma Shah, so I tested it last night at just the right range. The light is the rifle's sight. He lifted the gun, pointed it up into the trees, and picked out the top step leading to the platform that he had just left. Just spot your target, pull the trigger, and that's it. That was it, complimented Biff, but it took a good cool hands and steady nerves to do it. Barma Shah's ragged features spread into a broad smile. He suggested that instead of going back to the village, the boys accompany him to the hunting lodge at Kiwal. Biff accepted the invitation, but Chandra wanted to return to Supari to give the villagers a first-hand account of his harrowing experience in the cage. Naturally, he needed Kamuka to support his testimony, so Barma Shah agreed to pick them up at Supari in the morning. The Kiwal hunting lodge impressed Biff immensely, as it was equipped with all modern conveniences, including air conditioning. It also had a telephone, to which Barma Shah gestured as soon as he and Biff were alone. Then, with a broad, pleased smile, he declared, I talked with Calcutta by long distance this afternoon. You will be glad to know that Diwan Chand and his gatekeeper, Nathu, came out all right. Nobody was after them. Biff grinned, then became serious. I know that, he said, they were after me. And this. Biff brought out the watertight container. From it he took the chamois bag, then the jewel case, finally the huge glowing ruby. He handed the jewel to Barma Shah, who studied it as though he had seen it often. Then as the stone's glint suddenly became more vivid, Biff added, Diwan Chan said its sparkle showed that the charm was working well, but you had a lot to do with that tonight. Tonight, perhaps, yes, Barma Shah returned the gem to Biff and shook his head. But the other day, if I had known you would run into that trouble at Chan's, I would have gone there myself instead. But Mr. Chan said that you were marked. True, but so were you, as it turned out. Yes, agreed Biff, but Chandra helped me out fast enough. Our real trouble was with the thugs on the road. Thugs on the road? Tell me about that. Biff detailed the incidents of the train trip, the detour by the old abandoned temple, and their final arrival at the Grand Trunk Road. As he concluded the account, Barma Shah shook his head again. And to think that I let you go through all that, he said, while I was waiting for you on the Grand Trunk Road. But how, queried Biff, did you know that we were coming that way? From your father, explained Barma Shah. He told me all about Chandra, the boy who worked for Jinnah Jad. That is why I came here to Kiwal, so I would be near the village of Supari, where Chandra's uncle lives. Naturally, Chandra would bring you there. But how did we happen to come along just when you were here for a tiger hunt and the villagers were so terribly excited over it? They are always tiger hunting here at Kiwal, replied Barma Shah with a smile, and the people in Supari are easily excited. If Matapar cries tiger, tiger, he knows that Thakur will bring out the villagers as beaters by day and even as bait by night. I never thought of that. And I never realised that the thugs were so active again, commented Barma Shah. The way the Kali cult took over that old temple is surprising indeed. I shall notify the local authorities and have them investigate it. Perhaps it is more widespread than it appears. 
The next day, Barma Shah and Biff drove over to the village and picked up Chandra and Kamuka. They continued on their way, laughing over the fact that, of all the party, the one that had taken the worst beating from the tiger hunt was the jeep. However, the staunch vehicle was in good running order, and the boys began to enjoy their tour with Barma Shah. A tour it actually became, for Barma Shah decided it should be that way. He even insisted that Chandra put on European clothes similar to what Biff and Kamuka were wearing. So they stopped at the first important town on the Grand Trunk Road and bought Chandra his new outfit. Chandra was amazed when he studied himself in a big mirror at the clothing store. This is better than any jadu, decided Chandra. If Jinnah Jad should put me in the basket wearing my old clothes and bring me out in new like these, people would think I was a different boy. You'd have to make jadu yourself, returned Biff. It would take real magic for you to change clothes while you were curled around the inside of that basket. Chandra laughed at that, and then the laugh was turned on Biff when Barma Shah picked out a woven straw hat with a rounded dome-shaped crown and broad, sharply downturned brim. He placed it on Biff's head, saying, Try this on for size. The hat was so big that it came clear down over Biff's eyes, the brim hiding his face almost to the jawline. Looks like Biff is trying the basket trick himself, observed Chandra merrily. Where did he go, Kamuka? I don't know, replied Kamuka. Last I saw, he was climbing into a basket that looked like a hat. Now he is vanished, complete. Biff ripped off the hat, somewhat red-faced and flustered, only to enjoy a laugh himself when he saw Chandra and Kamuka peering over counters and behind racks as though they were trying to find where he had gone. Then Barma Shah was handing Biff some smaller hats of the same style, and among them Biff discovered one that was just his size. Very good, approved Barma Shah. That brim still comes low enough to hide your hair rather well. And the sun visor helps too. The visor was of dark transparent plastic set in front of the hat brim and it added somewhat to the depth of Biff's tan. It proved helpful, too, when Biff was driving the jeep, for Varma Shah decided to travel along secondary highways that lacked the shade provided by the Grand Trunk Road. Traffic, too, was less, but rough stretches of road slowed their trip. There were delays, too, at rivers where there were no bridges, only ferries that looked like tiny floats or rafts, the sort that might tip the jeep into the first current they encountered. But the rafts were well balanced, and the natives were skilful with their poles and oars. Each crossing was made without incident. Barma Shah had brought sleeping bags and bedding so they could stop at Dak bungalows or rest houses along the way. To all appearances, Barma Shah might have been a private tutor taking some privileged scholars on an educational tour of the Indian byroads. And in fact, the boys were learning a lot. Biff was especially impressed by the monkeys. He thought he had already seen a lot of them in India, but now they were boldly jumping over the jeep whenever it stopped and ready to snatch up whatever they saw and wanted. Chandra said there were a hundred million monkeys in India. Biff was ready to believe it when they stopped at a Dak bungalow near Agra and had to slam doors in the faces of the creatures to keep them from coming in the bedrooms. That afternoon they drove into Agra to see the famed Taj Mahal on the bank of the Jamuna River. One of the world's most beautiful buildings, it impressed Biff as a dream brought to reality in living marble. Later they went to a telegraph office where Biff sent a wire to his mother, which simply stated, All well, still on way, love to you and twins. Barma Shah decided that the telegram told enough, yet not too much. He smiled when Biff also showed him a postcard with a picture of the Taj Mahal, which had the printed statement, India's most priceless jewel for you to hold in memory. Under that, Biff had written, and I really am holding it, bag and all. Biff. He had addressed a card to Likake Mehaneli at Darjeeling. Send it, decided Barma Shah. Only your Hawaiian friend will know that you mean the ruby rather than the Taj Mahal. 
After dinner at a restaurant in Agra, they drove back to view the Taj by moonlight, when its graceful marble dome and slender minarets were softened into an incomparable silvery whiteness, a striking contrast to its splendour by day. They were still talking about the Taj when they arrived back at the rest house, where they reduced their tones to whispers rather than roused the monkeys, which apparently had gone to sleep in the trees. But when Biff himself was dozing off, he heard occasional patter on the roof and scratchy sounds outside his window, indicating that some of the creatures were about. In his dreams, Biff could see monkeys swarming over everything, even the Taj Mahal, until, oddly, they seemed to be clambering over the cot itself. Still half asleep, yet aware of where he was, Biff could feel their breath on his face, their pesky hands clutching at the bag containing the ruby. Then Biff's eyes came open. He made a convulsive grab with both hands. In the filtering moonlight from the window, he saw a face that was human in size and form, yet leering like a monkey's. He caught hands that were human too, but long, thin-fingered, and as writhing in their touch as a snake's coils. Swiftly, expertly, those hands had grabbed the pouch that contained the great ruby and were twisting its chain around Biff's neck like a strangle cord. End of chapter 11 Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London Chapter 12 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London Chapter 12 A Double Surprise The struggle that followed was frantic but brief. It couldn't have lasted long, for Viff was unable to wrench the attacker's hands from the chain that they so cruelly twisted. It was already cutting off Biff's breath and blood supply, so that his eyes were seeing black spots in the moonlight. Biff shifted his grip to his attacker's throat, but it didn't help. If anything, it made him twist the chain harder. Biff couldn't call for help, though the walls of the bungalow were thin enough for even a gargly cry to be heard. But there was a way to make people hear. As he lashed about, Biff managed to shove the cot away from the wall. Then, wrenching himself to a new position, he began kicking the wall with his feet, pounding a terrific drumbeat. There was a muffled, excited cry from the next room, then answering shouts above the din that Biff was raising. The whole Dak bungalow was aroused. Right then, Biff was hoping to jab his attacker's neck nerves, judo style, which would have turned the tables completely. But his squirmy foe didn't wait. He managed to yank the ruby bag clear from its chain. Griffing his prize, he twisted away, turned and bounded for the window. Biff beat him there by rolling over on his hands and knees, then blocking the fugitive with a headlong dive. The squirmy man turned and darted towards the door, just as it burst open and Barma Shah came driving in. He met the attacker and snatched for the bag which came open, spilling out the ruby. By then, Biff was piling into the fray. He and Barma Shah both grabbed for the gleaming gem, while the squirmy man took off empty-handed. It was Barma Shah who saved the ruby with one hand, while he held Biff back with the other. Chandra and Kamuka were already taking up the chase from their rooms, as were other guests. Coolly, Barma Shah told Biff, Leave it to them. We don't want people to know what the fellow was after. Here is the ruby, so put it away again. The advice was good, so Biff accepted it. For the moment he wondered if they'd really regained the ruby, for it looked as dull as a lump of coal there in Barma Shah's hand. But as Biff took it, all the gem's lustre returned, and it scintillated in the moonlight with a vivid fire that seemed to throw off living sparks. Satisfied, Biff put the ruby back in its bag. The excitement roused hundreds of monkeys from their tree trunks, and with all their jumping and chatter, no one was able to catch up with Biff's attacker. The Kansama who kept the Dak bungalow was all apologies when an examination showed that Biff's window screen had been loosened, by whom no one knew. Barma Shah, a spokesman for the boys, dismissed it as a trifling matter. But in the morning, Barma Shah went into Agra to talk to the police. He returned in time for an early lunch, which the Kansama, who was cook as well as innkeeper, had specially prepared. It consisted of dalmoth, or fried lentils, with thin shavings of lentil paste, and it was followed by a dish of petha, 
a crystallized melon served in slices. When Barma Shah and the boys pulled away in the jeep, he had made no further mention of the near robbery of the night before. But as they rode along the highway towards Delhi, Barma Shah discussed the matter with the boys. The police weren't impressed, Barma Shah declared. They say there is nothing to this talk of thuggy coming back in the form of a Kala cult. People are simply confusing them with roving bands of thieves, like the old Pindaris. Other countries have gangsters, why not India? But we saw the Kali statue, Biff began. I know. Well, declared Barma Shah, whether that man last night was a petty thief or a thug playing a lone hand to deceive us, we won't take more chances. Barma Shah's method was simple. They drove on to Delhi and pulled into the old city after dark. There, Barma Shah let the boys off on a quiet street and continued on alone in the jeep towards Simla. He had given them an address where they could find him. Only a block from where they were dropped off, the boys came to a rooming house that Barma Shah had mentioned. They stayed there overnight and began planning their next step, which was to reach the American embassy without attracting special notice. See what you can find out, Chandra, suggested Biff. Say that you're a student who would like to know about the United States. Remember, there are a lot of American nations, so be sure to specify the United States. Maybe we can slide you in there to pave the way for me. All this was in keeping with advice from Diwan Chand in Calcutta, which Barma Shah in his turn had stressed even more, namely that spies might be watching every move that Biff made. Events along the line had definitely underlined the need for caution. So Chandra, still wearing his European clothes, set out on a hired bicycle, the most popular type of transportation in India's capital city of New Delhi, which adjoined the old Mughal capital of Delhi. A few hours later, Chandra rejoined the other boys in a colourful bazaar where he had left them. I have good news, he exclaimed. Every week students go by special bus to meet and talk with ambassadors from other countries. That sounds like a United Nations proposition, commented Biff. No, no, returned Chandra. I checked that. They go to a different country's embassy every week. So I look at the list, and what do you think is next? United States, tomorrow. Nice work, approved Biff. That sounds like our ticket, all right. It is our ticket, all right, Chandra grinned. Three tickets for bus tomorrow. I ask and I get them. So we go along with big crowd and nobody will guess who we are. Since the students were all from Indian schools located in New Delhi and elsewhere, Chandra and Kamuka decided to stay in their European clothes, but Viv, somewhat to his annoyance, had to switch back to his Sikh costume. Otherwise he would be spotted for an American and perhaps for himself. Biff Brewster, if some keen observer happened to be looking for him. I suppose any Sikh students will be wearing their native garb too, commented Biff, like the railroad guards on the train. So don't let them spot me for a phony the way that man with the fake beard did on the Howrah bus. Funny thing, said Chandra, I keep thinking about him every now and then. I don't know just why, but don't worry, Kamuka and I will talk to people so they won't bother you. The bus tickets were simply cards that said student in English and its equivalent in Hindi characters. They were accepted without question and the boys took seats well back in the bus, which was nearly full when it started. All was fine until they stopped at a building where Biff looked up and saw a flag with three vertical stripes, red, white and green. You've made a mistake, Chandra, Biff groaned. This can't be the American embassy. That's not the United States flag. It must be, argued Chandra. Lots of countries change their flags. Maybe your country changes its flags too. No, we don't change the United States flag. From the bus window, Biff saw the flag flutter slightly, and now he noticed the emblem of an eagle on the white stripe. That's the Mexican flag, exclaimed Biff. As a sudden thought struck him, he asked, Just what did that list say, Chandra? It said students would pay visit to the embassy of the United States of... of... 
the United States of Mexico. Yes, that was it. It's my fault, Chandra conceded Biff. I forgot that Mexico is officially known as the United States of Mexico. I should have told you the United States of America. Then you'd have checked on the American embassy. He turned to Kamuka. Dumb of me, wasn't it? Maybe I was dumb too, returned Kamuka. If I had told Chandra to look for the United States of Brazil, he would have brought us to the Brazilian embassy. I could tell our story there. You're right, Kamuka, acknowledged Biff. We had two chances out of three and we missed. Well, we can't sit here. We will have to follow the crowd. Follow the crowd they did. As the last three off the bus, Biff and his companions tagged on into the Mexican embassy and slid into a rear corner of the reception room where the students were seated. Members of the Mexican diplomatic corps proceeded to hold open forum with the students of New India, exchanging views on their respective countries. After an hour's session was completed, the students started out, shaking hands with the embassy staff as they went. Again, Biff and his companions held back. They were able to ease along behind the students, who were so interested in exchanging their own views that they did not notice the dragging trio. Biff, particularly, was glad to avoid the handshakes. The diplomat showed interest in a few genuine Sikh students, and Biff was afraid he would be asked embarrassing questions. There was just one greeter they could not avoid. Outside the reception room, a Mexican youth of about Biff's age had come up to shake hands with the students and was chatting briefly with them. Fortunately, his back was partly turned, so Biff saw a way to avoid him. You shake hands with him first, Kamuka, Biff whispered, but keep moving or he may guess that you are a Brazilian. You crowd in fast, Chandra, and keep him talking while I slide by. They had reached the youth by then, and Kamuka's handshake was over too quickly. Chandra, caught off stride, could not think what to say, so the young Mexican politely bowed him on with a brief shake, then turned with perfect poise to meet the last departing visitor, Biff. The Mexican's expression was momentarily quizzical as he studied the face beneath the Sikh turban. Chandra and Kamuka, glancing back, were sure Biff was getting by with his disguise when, to their horror, Biff himself gave the game away. As though suddenly gone crazy, Biff flung away his turban, sprang forward, grabbed the Mexican boy's shoulders, and began shaking the poise right out of him. The surprised youth gasped and grabbed at Biff as if in self-defense. Chandra and Kamuka turned to ward off any students who might come back to mix in the fray, only to see that they were all alone. That was when they heard Biff's shout, Mike Arista! Then Chandra and Kamuka realized it wasn't a fight at all, but just a genuine, heartfelt form of mutual recognition, as the Mexican boy exclaimed, Biff Brewster! End of chapter 12 Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London Chapter 13 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. Chapter 13 Biff's Mission. The excitement of the meeting over, Biff realized that introductions were in order. He turned to Chandra and Kamuka. This is Miguel Arista, Mike to us, Biff said. He and I met in Mexico, where we went hunting for a lost Aztec treasure. We had some tough adventures together. Biff turned to Mike. This is Kamuka, Biff continued. I told you once about the trip that I took up the Amazon with him. And this is Chandra, the newest member of the team. He steered us through a lot of trouble from Calcutta to New Delhi. And I'm glad he did, returned Mike. We've been watching for you everywhere. That is, for you and Kamuka, Biff. We hadn't heard about Chandra. We alerted the American and Brazilian embassies in case you turned up there. So, of all things, you walked into the Mexican embassy, the last place we expected to see you. How did that happen? That, replied Biff with a smile, was Chandra's idea. It looks like I picked the right United States, put in Chandra. He turned to Biff and Kamuka. 
You had chance number one and two. That gave me chance number three. I hit it right. You sure did, Biff agreed. He turned to Mike. But how do you come to be in India? How do you know about all this? You remember my uncle, the judge in Mexico City? Of course. I came here with him on a visit, and we happened to meet your father. My uncle can tell you about it better than I can. Mike paused a moment, then asked, Do you have the ruby? For answer, Biff looked around and saw that he and his friends were alone. Then he brought out the priceless packet, opened it, and displayed the light of the llama. It took Mike's breath away. Never before, perhaps, had the rare gem flashed more vividly, more dramatically, than at that moment. That was all Mike needed to see. Put it away, he said. We'll go over to my uncle's hotel and talk to him. Mike arranged for a cab and they went to the hotel. There they met Judge Felix Arista, a quiet man with a white beard and flowing hair that gave him a very austere expression. But the kindly welcome that he gave to Biff put Chandra and Kamuka completely at their ease. Then Judge Arista went further. He spoke to Kamuka in Portuguese, then to Chandra in Hindi so fluently that both boys were quite overwhelmed. Judge Arista also assured Biff that all was well with his father, the last they had heard from him. Next, Judge Arista introduced a middle-aged man of military bearing named Colonel Gorak, who evidently held some key position with the government of India. Both were keenly interested in the ruby when Biff produced it. Then Judge Arista turned to the boys and said, Tell us all that has happened. Though Biff was eager to hear more about his father, he realized that Judge Aristo was following proper procedure, learning the facts so that he and Colonel Gorak could weigh them. Biff related the events from the time the Northern Star had docked in Calcutta. Judge Aristo encouraged Kamuka and Chandra to add their impressions. Chandra especially came in for questioning regarding Jinnah Jad, Diwan Chand and Barma Shah. All three boys had much to say about Barma Shah and their adventures with him, including how he had saved Biff's life during the tiger hunt and had later responded to Biff's call when a thug had tried to steal the ruby at the Dak bungalow. Judge Arista finally turned to Colonel Gorak and said, I am sure that we can trust these other boys as well as Biff, so I think they should all hear what you have to tell him about Senor Brewster. Colonel Gorak bowed acknowledgement, then spoke to Biff in an even, methodical tone. Your father came here to India to open some old gold mines, related Colonel Gorak. We were hopeful that investors would supply money to work them. Among these mines were some that once belonged to the Raja of Bildapur, a small domain that was absorbed by a larger princely state though the Raja's family still owned the mines until the Indian government finally acquired them. When miners went down into the old shafts, they met with inexplicable accidents. They claimed that the mines were haunted by ghosts and demons, but we blamed it on outside factions. However, Mr. Brewster found there was some basis for the superstition, as it was part of a legend dating back 500 years. As Colonel Gorak paused, Kamuka exclaimed despite himself, Five hundred years? That is a long, long time. Not in India, put in Chandra promptly. Here it is very short. Quite true, agreed Colonel Gorak seriously. Five hundred years ago, the ruling Raja of Bildapur received a magnificent ruby from the Grand Lama of Chonsi, a lost city near the border of India and Tibet. The saying was, while the light of the Lama shines, so will the star of the Raja. And that proved true, for the mines showed steady profits and were finally sold at a good price. Part of those profits were invested in gems which the Raja's family promised to give to the Chonsi Lama in return for the luck the ruby had brought them. That was to be done if ever the Raja's descendants disposed of their holding, which they finally did. But Mr. Brewster learned that the gems had been hidden by loyal servants of the Raja's family because outsiders were seeking them. As Colonel Gorak paused, Biff asked, 
By outsiders, do you mean the Kali cult, sir? For one, yes. For another, there is an international spy ring run by an adventurer named Bella Kron. We know little about him except that he will sell out to the highest bidder. Fortunately, Mr. Brewster located the gems and brought them here to New Delhi. And as I was here, added Judge Alistair, he came to see me first. I realized that this was an international matter, so I pressed it through the proper channels, and Colonel Gorak was assigned to the case. He has done admirably with it. Colonel Gorak shook his head to that. The real credit goes to Mr. Brewster, he insisted. His story was fantastic, but he had the gems to prove it and Judge Arista to vouch for him. So we had him go to Ladakh in eastern Kashmir, where he contacted secret messengers from the Grand Lama. They took him to Chonsi, where he delivered the jewels with the compliments of our government. There was just one problem. The light of the Lama was not among the gems. With that, Colonel Gorak gestured to the huge ruby that was glowing in the sunlight, as though its ruddy fire held all the secrets of the past centuries. Never had its sparkle been more vivid. No one could wonder why this was the most prized gem of all. We should have thought of that beforehand, declared Judge Elister, but we had not then seen the light of the Lama. He studied the gem again, then turned to Colonel Gorak. I can understand why the Chauncey Lama wants it, he said. Colonel Gorak nodded. So can I, he agreed. Then the Lama is keeping my father in Chauncey, asked Biff anxiously, until he gets the ruby, like a ransom. Not exactly, replied Colonel Gorak. Your father is still in Chauncey, yes. Because they won't let him go? No, no. It was Judge Arista who replied to Biff's anxious question. I am sure that he could leave at any time, but his mission would not have been completed. He wants to deliver the ruby too, explained Colonel Gorak, and he was sure that Barma Shah would be able to locate it because they had been working on it together, your father and Barma Shah. That calmed Biff immediately. His mind flashed back to the tiger hunt when Barma Shah had delivered that perfect shot while the shikaris were wondering what to do. Then he thought of the Dak bungalow and the way Barma Shah had rescued him there. Chandra must have realised what was in Biff's mind. It is all right, Biff, Chandra said encouragingly. Your father and Barma Shah, they are a team. Biff brightened as he turned to Judge Arista. You mean that I am to go with Barma Shah, the boy asked, that he will be there too when we deliver the ruby? Exactly that, acknowledged Judge Arista. We are counting on both of you. Your father said that he had arranged for you to receive the ruby and that Barma Shah would do the rest. I have arranged for our trip to Chauncey, added Colonel Gorak. We can notify Barma Shah to meet us in Srinagar, the capital of Kashmir. From there, we will fly to Leh, the capital of Ladakh, where our equipment has been ordered and is waiting for us. Two thoughts swam through Biff's mind. In flying anywhere, he would like to be in a plane piloted by his uncle, Charles Keane, who, to Biff's thinking, was the greatest pilot ever. Next to his father, Uncle Charlie was the man he would most like to see right now. The other thought was, what was happening in Darjeeling? He felt concerned about his mother and the twins, and he was worried about Lee, who by now probably was worried about him. Su Tio Carlos, said Judge Arista, as though he had read Biff's mind. Your Uncle Charles. We reached him in Burma and asked him to fly from there to Darjeeling, so he would be ready to take off for Leh to join your party there. He is in Darjeeling now. With that, Judge Arista picked up the telephone and handed it to Biff, adding with a kindly smile, we have put in a long-distance call to your family in Darjeeling. You can talk to them right now. End of chapter 13 Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London Chapter 14 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London 
Chapter 14, The Valley of Doom Biff was right about Lee being worried. From the time he had arrived in Darjeeling, after a ride in from the airport at Bagdogra, Lee's worries had begun and stayed with him. He was wondering constantly how much he could tell the Brewsters if they asked him point-blank about Biff. Biff's mother, Martha Brewster, had met Likake Mayanelli in Hawaii at the time Biff and Lee had gone on their thrilling sea hunt together. The Brewster twins, 11-year-old Ted and Monica, had met Lee too, and they were bubbling with delight at seeing him again. Of course, they wanted to see their big brother too, so they peppered Lee with so many rapid-fire questions about Biff that Lee hadn't time to answer any of them, which turned out for the best. In a slightly reproving tone, Mrs. Brewster had suggested that the twins give their guest a chance to speak for himself. Thanks to that breather, as Biff would have termed it, Lee was able to state simply that Biff and Kamuka had gone directly to New Delhi in response to a message from Mr. Brewster. We heard from New Delhi too, Mrs. Brewster said. Mr. Brewster's company wired that he would be delayed and that Biff was being notified what to do. I'll bet Dad has taken Biff to see some super special gold mines, exclaimed Ted. I wish he'd asked me along. That must be it, added Monica, because Kamuka has been studying mining in Brazil. I'd like to have gone too. It's nice to hear you two agree on something, was Mrs. Brewster's smiling comment. But please notice that Likaki isn't sulking because he wasn't taken on the trip. That's the way a real grown-up would act. Lee didn't mention that Biff had also received a wire from the Ajax Mining Company. He merely said that he was sure they would hear from Biff as soon as he reached New Delhi. As the days passed, the twins had a wonderful time with Lee. Among other things, they went on a picnic to Tiger Hill, where they viewed Mount Everest, the world's highest peak, which towered more than 29,000 feet. To Lee, it was no more impressive than the 28,000-foot summit of Kanchenjunga, which could be seen from Darjeeling. But he reserved opinion on that and almost everything else, rather than start the twins speculating on what their brother Biff might think about it. The next step then would be, why hadn't they heard from Biff? A question Lee couldn't answer. Lee was relieved when Biff's wire came from Agra because he honestly didn't know why Biff had stopped there. But Lee knew nothing yet of the postcard which was still on its way when Mrs. Brewster's brother, Charles Keane, flew in from Burma and stated that he had been summoned to Darjeeling by an official call from New Delhi. With Charles Keane in the twin-engine Cessna was a burly, red-haired mechanic known as Muscles, who hailed from the state of Kentucky and was proud of it. The plane also brought a Burmese boy named Chuba, who had guided Biff across the border into China to rescue Biff's uncle when he had been a prisoner there. Biff had detailed those adventures to Lee, who already regarded Chuba as an old friend. So after a brief but hearty get acquainted session, Lee decided to confide in Chuba. They had taken a stroll to look at the Kanchenjunga, which Lee stated was the third highest mountain in the world, when Chuba asked what two were bigger, Lee told him, Everest and K2, known as Mount Godwin, Austin, which was far north in Kashmir. Chuba shrugged at that. To me, Minya Konka looks bigger, he asserted. That's the mountain Biff and I saw in China. Perhaps that is because we got a look at it from lower down. Kamuka would say that about the Andes, laughed Lee. To him... They would look bigger. Seriously, he added, that was while you were hunting for Viss, Uncle Charlie? Chuba nodded. We may have to start a search for Viss' father, continued Lee. Biff only heard from him indirectly. Noting Chuba's keen interest, Lee told him all that had happened in Calcutta. He also mentioned his worry about whether or not he should inform Biff's family as to those facts or wait until he received direct word from Biff. Chuba promptly solved that problem. You have trouble, Chava told Lee, and Sahib Keen is trouble shooter. If you don't hear from Biff by tomorrow, I'll talk to Sahib Keen. Then he will talk to you. They didn't have to talk with Charles Keen the next day, for they talked to Biff himself instead. 
That was when the long-distance call came from Judge Arista in New Delhi. Biff talked to his mother first, explaining the situation briefly. Then Judge Arista came on the wire, assuring Mrs. Brewster that all was probably well with her husband. At the same time, Judge Arista stated that the trip to Chauncey was not only urgent but dangerous. Colonel Gorak confirmed that when he spoke both to Biff's mother and his uncle Charlie, but all agreed that the mission was imperative, and since it was necessary for Biff to accompany the party, the other boys should have their choice in the matter too. Their choice was unanimous. They all said they would go. Lee and Chuba talked to Biff and told him that. Then Biff introduced Kamuka and Chandra to Chuba, and finally he had Mike Arista on the line, having him meet both Lee and Chuba. It was Uncle Charlie who ended that round robin. Let me get my instructions, he insisted, taking the telephone from the boys at his end before the Indian government has to dig another gold mine to pay for this long-distance call. Uncle Charlie not only took instructions, he was filled in on all the details of the Rajah's Ruby, otherwise known as the Light of the Lama, as well as Biff's adventures since leaving Calcutta. Uncle Charlie went into all that for the benefit of the breathless listeners, who included his nephew Ted and his niece Monica. Then... We're taking off today, Charles Keane stated, by way of Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Then a big hop over to Leh. If bad weather delays us, we can meet the party somewhere between Leh and the Tibetan border. They've given me a list of locations where they will stop. So let's get ready to go. That was meant for Lee and Chuba, but Ted and Monica thought that they were included, for they jumped up and were rushing off to pack when their Uncle Charlie called them back. No small fry, he said. You're staying here. Oh, no, the twins wailed in one voice. We both voted to go. That vote was for teenagers only, returned Uncle Charlie. Somebody has to stay here and look after your mother. Besides, the Cessna only carries five passengers, and we have four already, Lee, Chava, Muscle, and myself. But if we're small fry, argued Monica, the two of us would only count as one. Or maybe you don't want girls along, interrupted Ted. So in that case, you can take just me. Monica turned on Ted at that and was pounding him to show how tough her fist could really be when Uncle Charlie moved in and separated them as he said, Break it up. Muscles is so big he counts for two, so that makes five passengers already. Sorry, no more room. When they reached the airfield, Muscles had the plane all ready for the flight. The massive mechanic was standing guard and glaring suspiciously at any workers who came near the plane. That is Muscles' way, Charles Keane said approvingly, with an international spy ring haunting an old gold mine and thugs trying to steal a ruby as a gift for the goddess Kali, Almost anything could happen to any of us anywhere. Then, with Charles Keane at the controls, the plane was climbing from the runway in the direction of the snow-capped Himalayas, where dozens of magnificent peaks seemed to grow into sight, to match huge Kanchenjunga and even more distant Everest. The higher the plane rose, the more mountains loomed above it. Avoiding those vast peaks, Charles Keane worked the plane above valleys and passes that formed openings in the massive barrier. The ranges rode skyward like great steps until the plane reached the fertile Kathmandu Valley near the centre of Nepal, a great green oasis in a vast desert of rocky crags and the perpetual snow of the surrounding Himalayas. Kathmandu was a colourful city of temples pedogas and palaces that rose from among lesser buildings and great open squares. The altitude was a little more than 4,000 feet, and Charles Keane made a landing at the airfield to check on weather reports, while Muscles gave the plane another going over. From there the plane took off westward, passing south of the great twin peaks of Annapurna and Dalagiri, gigantic sentinels twenty miles apart with Deep Valley tapering down to a river gorge between their five-mile summits. 
It's too soon to head north, decided Charles Keene, even though that gap does look inviting. It would take us into Tibet and we might have problems picking a course over into Kashmir. We'll do better this way. This way took them out of Nepal and soon they were flying over India again. There, Biff's uncle finally swung to the north and again the Himalayas loomed ahead. Then they were knifing through fleecy clouds at 250 miles an hour straight towards the disputed Tibetan border. This course will bring us into Leh, Charles Keane declared, as the clouds began to thicken, but we'd better get more altitude. A gigantic mass of solid snowy white rose through a rift in the clouds. As the plane skimmed over it, they all drew a relieved breath. We nearly scraped frosting off cake, Chuba said. Charles Keane smiled, but a bit grimly, as he studied his chart again. Then, if that was Nanda Devi, he declared, we are away off course. He turned to muscles. Is the altimeter right, he asked. It was when I checked it last. Then we aren't climbing as we should. The plane droned on, in and out of cloud banks, above valleys filled with mist. Fortunately, no more mountains rose in their path, but clouds were thickening up ahead, and the plane was not responding properly. We're almost over the northern range, Uncle Charlie said, but tackling those cloud banks would be risky, and turning back would be worse. We'll do better making a forced landing in one of those forgotten valleys. Providing the visibility is good enough at landing level, put in muscles, we may encounter ground fog. That's the chance we take, Uncle Charlie conceded, but I don't think it has settled deeply yet. Coolly, Charles Keane zoomed over two low-lying mountain ranges, then banked his plane towards a wide space where a trace of green showed deep beneath the gathering mist. The white blanket thickened as he approached it, and the plane, as he descended, was swallowed completely in those swirling folds. The roar of the motor was muffled, then it, too, faded entirely. Silence reigned again above the mist-filled valleys of the Himalayas, the strange, mysterious stillness that the mightiest of mountains had known since the dawn of time. End of chapter 14 Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London Chapter 15 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 15. The Caravan Halts. So this is Strinagar. Biff Brewster spoke from the bow of a narrow, rakish craft known as a Shikara. As two turbaned oarsmen propelled us along the river Jhelum through the heart of Kashmir's capital city. Between Biff and the stern, where both paddlers were seated, was a large canopy mounted on ornamental poles. Reclining beneath it were Chandra, Kamuka, and Mike Arista. The front of the canopy bore the boat's name, Happy Days, for these gondolas of the Himalayan Venice were particularly popular with American visitors. As they swept along beneath the ancient wooden bridges that spanned the Jhelum, the boys waved to passengers in passing shikaras with signs bearing such varied titles as Hot Dog, The Big Mo, and Chattanooga Choo Choo. Picturesque buildings flanked both sides of the waterway, and beneath their balconies were native craft called Dungas, on which whole families lived. Far more pretentious were the lavish houseboats occupied by Europeans and Americans. These were more in evidence after the Shikara brought them to the Dal Gate, the outlet for Dal Lake. From there they followed more canals to the lake itself, where they wove among actual floating gardens to the five-mile stretch of open water beyond. Sunset was tinging Dal Lake with a deep crimson that purpled the blue lake and its surrounding foliage against the magnificent backdrop of the snow-clad Himalayas. Fine sunset, Kamuka appraised it, much better than on the Hooli. And all we need, commented Biff, studying the mirrored sunset in the placid water, is for a boar to come roaring down the lake. This water buggy would really wind up in a happy daze. 
Even that imaginary menace was ended when they reached their destination, a houseboat named Pride of the Deodars. This was a stout ship in its own right, measuring 120 feet from stem to stern, as Biff put it, with a width or beam of 16 feet. Before taking off from New Delhi, Colonel Gorak had engaged the pride of the Deodars for their overnight stay in Srinagar and had come directly here while the boys were taking their river trip. Smilingly, the colonel showed them through an actual floating mansion, for the pride, as the boys promptly called it, had a huge living room and a sizable dining room, each with a fireplace, plus three bedrooms with private baths. A native chef, served a tasty dinner from the ample kitchen. After the meal, the boys went to the living room. They were seated in front of the fireplace when a light glimmered cautiously from the water close by and they heard a shikara scrape alongside the pride. Barma Shah, stated Colonel Gorak. I contacted him at the address in Simla. Gorak turned to Biff. I'd never met him, so you can introduce us. When Barma Shah entered, he was wearing his beret and tinted glasses, as excellent a disguise as ever, for when he removed them, his complexion changed in colour and his face seemed to broaden, probably because of his widespread ears. His high forehead and short clipped hair were deceptive too, for the beret had hidden them well. Colonel Gorak nodded his approval. I can understand why you have managed to stay under cover, Gorak declared. I have dozens of reports from men who have contacted you at one time or another. The colonel gestured to an attaché case on the table, but not one could give me more than a vague description of you. Unfortunately, most of those who knew me best are gone, returned Barma Shah in a regretful tone. They were marked for death, as I have been. I know that, nodded Colonel Gorak. All of you were in constant danger from all sides when you tried to quell those riots between rival factions, especially in Calcutta. The danger still is great, declared Barma Shah, and that is why I show myself so seldom. During the past year or more, only two men really met me face to face, so far as learning my identity. One was Diwan Chand, and the other, Thomas Brewster. Recently, of course... He gestured towards Biff and his companions. I told these boys who I was, because once I was clear of Calcutta, I felt the need for secrecy was gone. So now, Barma Shah finished with a bow, we meet at last, Colonel Gorak. And the meeting is a timely one, returned Gorak, because you are the man who can help us most. The colonel spread out a large map of Kashmir on the table, ran his finger from Srinagar eastward to Leh, the principal city of Ladakh. Then he inched it, zigzag fashion, towards the boundary between India and Tibet, which was marked with a dotted line, indicating its uncertainty. Charles Keane will meet you in Leh, explained Colonel Gorak, or at one of your later stopping points. When you reach the vicinity of Chauncey, wherever it may be, you will be contacted and guided to that lost city. Parma Shah looked up, slightly puzzled. You aren't coming with us, Colonel Gorak? he asked. No, this is not a military mission, nor even an official expedition. Mr. Brewster went there on his own and personally promised to deliver the Raja's ruby to the Chauncey Lama once the gem was found. Since the descendants of the Raja were supposed to deliver it to the successor of the Lama, tradition demands that Mr. Brewster's promise be fulfilled by his son. Again, in keeping with tradition, the boy should be accompanied by someone close of kin, so we have chosen his uncle Charles for that purpose. And since you, Barma Shah, played the vital part in recovering the lost ruby, you are entitled to go along as its temporary guardian. As Colonel Gorak finished, Barma Shah smiled. You should have picked Diwan Chand for my job, he said, but as for going along, I don't think Diwan Chand would have, so I guess I'll have to do. You will do very well. Any more questions? Just one, Colonel. What about the Chauncey Lama? Have you any reports on him? Nearly twenty years ago, stated Colonel Gorak, the Chauncey Lama visited Leh and received a tremendous ovation. 
He was then a man in his early thirties, and impressed all who met him with his great vigour and his keen mind. In the years since, the Chauncey Lama has preserved the balance of the border. He has refused to listen to the demands of dictators who have tried to curb his power. They are unable to oust him because they cannot find him. And all the while his influence has increased, Barma Shah inquired. Yes, today the Chauncey Lama is regarded as one of the wisest men in the East and, without a doubt, the most mysterious. No one has seen him since that time in Leh, but he has been heard from often, and his well-weighed decisions have increased his fame. Now in his early fifties he is probably at the peak of his career, that is, if lamas have careers. When one dies, his spirit is supposed to be reincarnated in an infant born at that same time, who then continues on as a living Buddha. Biff and the other boys wanted to hear more on that intriguing subject, but Barma Shah asked, Will anyone block us between Lay and Chauncey? One man will if he can, returned Gorak grimly. That is Bella Kron, who heads the international spy ring. Have you ever run across him here in India? No, but I would like to, Barma Shah gritted his teeth and clenched his fists. I would repay him in kind for the way he tortured some of my friends. I know, Colonel Gorak tapped the attaché case significantly. The reports are all in here, but would you recognise Belacron if you saw him? No, because I could not possibly have met him. Brewster may have, around those mines in Vildapur, but Belacron would have been very wary any time he came to Calcutta. That ended the conference for the evening. Tingling with excitement, the boys found it difficult to go to sleep, even in the luxurious houseboat. When they finally did drop off, the night seemed very short indeed, for Colonel Gorak woke them early for their morning flight to Leh. The 500-mile trip was interesting, for below the boys saw samples of the rugged terrain that they would have to cover later on. The nearest thing to a road was a crude trail that led through mountain passes 12,000 feet in altitude, where the plain flew low between the Hemming Himalaya ranges. There were occasional squatty villages and Buddhist monasteries perched high upon the mountainsides. These gave an idea of what Chauncey would be like if they ever found the place. The immediate objective was lay, and it proved interesting when they landed there, Though a town of only a few thousand inhabitants, its bazaars showed a mingling of many races, including tribes, in outlandish costumes, for this was the trade centre where goods came in from Tibet by caravan. Biff and his companions found the equipment ready and the arrangements all made for their trek to the border, but Charles Keene and his Cessna had not yet arrived. For two full days they waited with the strain continually increasing, the only news was a roundabout report from Kathmandu stating that the Cessna had put down there and then resumed its flight on the very day that Biff and his companions had flown from New Delhi up to Srinagar. On the third day, Colonel Gorak, who had come along this far, decided that the caravan must start. Barma Shah agreed. There is still a chance that your uncle's plane made a safe landing, Gorak told Biff, but by now he will suppose that you have left Leh, so there is no need of staying here. In fact, it would be a mistake, declared Barma Shah, for your uncle has our schedule and may be expecting us at one of the stopping posts. We are already a day late, but the first two stages are short, so we can make them in a single day. Paced by plodding, heavily laden yaks, they made the required distance by nightfall. Their course was towards the glistening mountains to the south. But the whiteness that worried Biff was not the snow upon the Himalayan summits. The thick clouds surrounding the lower levels were the menace. They filled the passes and the valleys beyond, the only places where the plane could have made a landing. By morning the clouds were heavier still and Barma Shah was anxious to make an early start because of the threatening snow. Biff pleaded with him to wait, so they did for another hour, studying the increasing snow clouds. It's no use, Barma Shah decided finally. We can hardly see the slopes now. Anyone coming through those passes would have to turn back. 
Biff nodded hopelessly, but as he took one last look through a pair of field glasses, he was sure he detected motion in the distant haze. Then, against the snowy background, he saw three figures. One paused as they struggled forward and waved his arms in a characteristic gesture. Excitedly, Biff exclaimed, Uncle Charlie! End of chapter 15 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 16 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 16 The Bamboo Bridge. Biff and the three boys with him started forward on the run to meet Charles Keene and his companions. They soon saw that one of the pair was Lee and since the other was about his size, it only took one guess for Biff to name him. Chuba! But by the time the two groups met, Biff had another name in mind as well. The first words he put were, Where's Muscles? Wasn't he along with you? Muscles is all right, Charles Keene assured him. We are too, but we had to speed up our pace the last few miles, otherwise we wouldn't have made it. When I get a cup of hot coffee, I'll tell you all about it. Lee and Chuba were just too winded to talk at all. When they reached the caravan, Barma Shah decided to delay the start until they had rested. That gave Charles Keene time to tell their story. He related how clouds had enveloped their plane high in the Himalayas. Rather than hit a mountain, he said, we chanced a landing in a valley. Fortunately, it was a deep one, and the fog hadn't fully settled. All of a sudden, green fields smacked right up at us. We banged up the plane some, but not too badly. What happened next was the odd part. Charles Keene paused to drink half his cup of coffee in one long, grateful swallow. Meanwhile, Lee and Chuba couldn't wait to pick the story up from there. A lot of natives wearing goatskins came rushing up to the plane, declared Lee. We thought they were going to mob us. They were shouting, Yeti, Yeti, over and over, put in Chuba. But before we could find out what they meant, Muscles went after them. You should have seen them run. Charles Keene laid aside his empty cup. Later they came creeping back, he said, and we made friends with them, so we didn't ask what they meant by shouting. He stopped suddenly as Barma Shah made frantic gestures for silence. A Ladakhi porter was standing by, staring with dark, narrowed eyes. Barma Shah told the man to bring some more hot coffee. Then when he was gone, Barma Shah confided, Don't mention the word Yeti to these people. You have heard of the giant ape-man of the Himalayas, haven't you? The creature they call the abominable snowman. That's their name for it, Yeti. I remember now, exclaimed Charles Keene. I was sure I'd heard the word before, but I thought that yarn was spiked long ago. Not in these mountains, rejoined Barma Shah. Here in Ladakh, as well as Kashmir, Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, Tibet, and even as far away as Yarkand, the Yeti is very real. The natives will run away if they even think such a creature is around. And we thought they meant the plane, exclaimed Lee. Yes, because we came down from the sky like a big bird, added Chuba. Bigger than they ever saw before. They may have blamed the Yeti for bringing such a monster, commented Barma Shah. But here comes the porter with the coffee, so let us avoid the word from now on. But where is Muscles? queried Biff. Back in the valley, looking after the plane, explained his uncle. Some of the tribesmen, Sherpas they call themselves, guided us over the mountain pass and then returned to their valley. We miscalculated slightly or we would have been here sooner. Despite the delay, the caravan completed its next stage ahead of the impending snowstorm. The patient yaks, creatures that resemble both the ox and the American buffalo, with long hair like the fleece of a sheep, responded to continued prodding as though they recognized the need for hurry. Tix, the chief porter and head yak driver, had a comment on that score. Listen and you hear yak grunt, he told the boys. That means two things. And what are those? asked Biff. One thing, yak like what happened, yes. Other thing, yak do not like what happened, no. And how, queried Mike, do you tell the grunts apart? No way to tell, replied Tix. Yak grunt the same exactly, whichever way he feel. 
but it is important just the same. And what makes it so important, demanded Lee, if you don't know the difference? You do know the difference, returned Tix. When Yak give grunt, he feel one way or other, maybe both. When Yak do not give grunt, Yak do not care. But why, asked Chuba, should Yaks feel both good and bad? These Yaks feel good, explained Tix, because they know they get to shelter ahead of snow. They feel bad because we make them hurry. So they say both things with one grunt. Simple. It looked simple indeed when they reached the day's goal, a small patch of grazing ground where dry grass spread to the foot of rocky slopes. There were stone huts for the members of the party and similar shelters for the yaks. The reason stones had been used in the construction was because there were plenty of them lying around and nothing else. The roofs of the buildings were made of rough boards covered with thatched leaves. They weren't nailed down because they didn't have to be. The builders had simply placed big stones on the roofs. The boys turned in early and slept late, snug in their sleeping bags and shoulder to shoulder in their huts. In the morning it took three of them to ram the door open. The snow was so deep. But the yaks were up, ready and grunting, some because they liked snow, others because they hated it. The yaks pulled the party through. They bulldozed their way through the snow, chest deep, clearing it like living snow plows, so that the people had no difficulty following them. Oddly, as the trail climbed higher, it led to barren ground, totally free from snow. Apparently, the storm clouds hadn't managed to gain that altitude. Early that afternoon, the party halted at a roaring mountain stream and stared at the remnants of a crude wooden bridge that had been washed away by the flood. Sadly, Tix petted one yak after another, while the porters relieved the stolid beasts of their burdens. The boys watched Tix turn the yaks over to two other Ladakis, who promptly drove them off along the trail. Barma Shah explained the situation. We'll have to make a footbridge, he stated, before the water rises too high. So Tix is sending the yaks on to another shelter. From now on, the porters will carry our packs. All the while, Biff could hear a chopping sound from a short way up the narrow, turbulent stream. There was a sudden crash and a tree came toppling down to bridge the raging torrent. Chandra appeared from the brush carrying a heavy hand axe. Bridge already set, reported Chandra. It just needs one thing more. It needs much more. The interruption came from a squatty, broadly built porter named Herdu as he tested the tree with a clumsy foot. We need ten more trees like this. We need a rail for the bridge, declared Chandra calmly. Can somebody bring me a rope? Biff supplied a rope, and Chandra hitched one end around a tree. Like a monkey, he scrambled across the fallen tree, carrying the free end of the rope with him. A single slip and Chandra would have gone into the flood, which probably would have pleased Herdu, who was watching intently. But Chandra was across in no time and promptly hitched the rope to a tree on the opposite bank, drawing it taut as he did. Now walk across log bridge, called Chandra, and hold on to rope rail. Biff shouldered a pack and followed instructions, keeping his eyes fixed straight ahead, not on the furious current, which would have distracted him. With one hand on the rope, it was simple to steady himself while he advanced one foot, then the other. A dozen steps and he was over. Now the other boys were following his example. That was all the porters needed. They hoisted their full burdens, 80 pounds to a man, and stalked across Chandra's simple bridge in regular procession. Charles Keane and Barma Shah followed, as did Tix and Herdu, though the last two exchanged glares before they started and after they had crossed. Now that the yaks had gone their way, a dispute appeared to be in the making as to who was the chief guide of the party. Both Tix and Herdu wanted that honour. The narrow path made a steep ascent up the side of a high cliff, and before the porters were out of sight of Chandra's crude bridge, they saw the surging stream carry it away. Time had been the all-important factor where that crossing was concerned. But an hour later the party came to something much more formidable. The trail swung along the fringe of a tremendous steep-walled gorge, a thousand feet in depth and a hundred or more across. 
Down below, a river thundered like a hungry dragon, ready to devour any human prey. Chandra was pleased to see that this chasm was already bridged, for he could have done nothing with his hand axe. The bridge was of a suspension type, so crude and flimsy of construction that it seemed to hover in mid-air. Yet it evidently was strong enough, for Barma Shah, who was up in front, started across without hesitation. Tix and Herdu were close behind him, followed by the long procession of porters with their heavy packs. As Biff paused to look for the other boys, he found Chuba close beside him. As usual, Chuba had a saying to fit the situation. Tix and Herdu agree on something at last, declared Chuba. Wise man never argue when it prove another man right. You've got something there, laughed Biff, as he watched Tix and Herdu practically crowd each other across the bridge. Neither could afford to hesitate, or he'd be admitting that the other was boss. From the look of that bridge, observed Lee, both were lucky to get across. The same goes for us, if we make it. Considering that the bridge cables were composed of twisted strands of bamboo and rattan, with hanging vines dangling like ropes to support the roadway, Lee had a point. But the other boys didn't agree. They had seen and crossed many such primitive bridges. Chuba in Burma, Chandra in India, Kamuka in Brazil, and Mike in Mexico. Though the porters crossed at a safe distance apart, they didn't begin to tax the bridge to its capacity. That was proven when the boys reached the bridge and saw that its runway, fashioned from strips of bamboo laid crosswise, was wide enough to drive a yak across. As the boys crossed the bridge two abreast, Biff spoke to Chandra, who was beside him. Now I see why Herdu wanted to chop down more trees back at the little stream. We could have brought the yaks along. Why wasn't Tix in favour of that? I saw Tix pet the yaks and say goodbye, returned Chandra. He made grunts like yak, saying he was both glad and sorry. Sorry because the yaks had to go, glad because it gave jobs to porters instead. You're right, exclaimed Biff. Colonel Gorak said the bearers were not to receive full pay until they actually took over. The tremendous roar of water echoed up from the steep-walled gorge, drowning further conversation until the boys were across. It might have been imagination, but Biff felt that the bridge quivered as he left it, so he turned to look back while Chandra, still beside him, was laying his pack on solid ground. They had come between a pair of upright posts that served as tower for the bridge. Now they were close by the big stakes to which the rope cables were moored. There, porters were stacking their packs by dozens and sitting down to rest. There were still several porters on the bridge, all well spaced. Behind them came Lee and Chuba, for those two boys had stayed back to wait for Charles Keane, who was bringing up the rear. Biff's uncle had taken on that duty to keep the parade moving, as he styled it, which meant that he had been encouraging straggling porters in his own cheery, breezy way. Lee and Chuba were past the halfway mark and Uncle Charlie was almost there when Biff saw the swaying bridge give a sudden shudder. Biff thought for an instant that it was an earth tremor. Then he noticed that the porters near him were chatting quite unconcerned. Biff gave a warning shout, too late. With a snap like a rifle report, the rope parted from the stake at Biff's right. With it, the entire cable slipped on that side of the bridge, tilting the runway downward. In a single second, Charles Keane, Lee, Chuba, and a pair of porters were sprawling on the slippery bamboo slats, which had suddenly become a chute to certain doom in the abyss below. End of chapter 16 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 17 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 17 The Monster of the Mountains In the harrowing moments that followed, Biff saw two shapes go slithering off the slanted bridge and continue spinning, tumbling in huddled helpless fashion into the gaping jaws of the roaring gorge. Biff shut his eyes as they disappeared, and his mind flashed back to those tiny figures that he had seen against the snowy background of the mountain pass. 
Uncle Charlie, Lee, and Chuba. The boys were two of a size, like those two forms that had just plunged from the collapsing bridge. So they must be Lee and Chuba, or else the two porters. But no, not the porters. Those somersaulting shapes weren't big enough. Biff tightened his fist grimly as he opened his eyes for one last hopeless look. Biff was right. It wasn't the porters. At the first warning quiver of the bridge, they had dropped their heavy burdens and made a desperate dive for safety. Nearly across, first one, then the other, had managed to grab the high edge of the canted runway and scramble to the ground beyond. But as Biff looked past them, his eyes opened really wide. It wasn't Lee or Chuba either. Both boys were still there, near the centre of the bridge, with Uncle Charlie. The moment the bridge had tilted one way and they had felt themselves sliding with it, all three had made a frantic grab in the other direction. Instinctively, they had gripped the upper side of the slender grass ropes that supported it. They were still hanging on. What Biff had seen tumble into the gorge were the bulky packs that the porters had flung aside. Those bulging burdens, when falling, had looked exactly like a pair of huddled humans. Now Uncle Charlie and the two boys were lightening weight by letting their own packs follow the path of the others. That still didn't guarantee them safety. The whole weight of the bridge was now swaying on a single rope cable. Sooner or later it was sure to snap, then all hope of rescue would be gone. Now chunks of the runway were breaking loose from the dangling ropes, which no longer bore their proportionate shares of the weight. That produced a new dilemma. It was impossible for Uncle Charlie, Lee and Chobba to work their way along that upper edge because of the gaps. They would have to reach the one remaining cable, climb it to the top of the tower post and come down to the ground. Lee and Chubber might manage it, but not Charles Keane with all his weight. Chandra had the answer. He had brought along the rope from his log bridge. He tossed one end to Biff, saying, Hang on tight. Then, carrying the other end, Chandra scrambled up the lone cable and practically slid from the post top out to where Lee and Chuba clung. There, Chandra, Lee and Chuba tied their rope end to the cable, while Biff, Mike and Kamuka hauled the rope taut and hitched the other end around the tower post. That filled the gaps along the level route to safety. Chandra went first, pausing to tie dangling liana strands to the new rope to keep it from sagging. Lee and Chuba followed, stopping to wait for Charles Keane, even when he twisted one arm in the rope and waved them on with his other hand. If Biff's uncle tired, they hoped to help him, but what Uncle Charlie lacked in agility, he made up for in endurance. After minutes that proved long and nerve-wracking for Biff and his watching companions, the other boys reached solid ground with Charles Keane right behind them. A moment later, Biff and the rest were swarming around Uncle Charlie and congratulating him while Varma Shah spoke approvingly. That was very good indeed, and just in time too. The wind is getting brisker from the gorge. What is left of the bridge will soon be gone. At a combined order from Tix and Herdu, the bearers gathered their packs. Then they were on their way again. As they veered away from the gorge, Biff took a last look back. The remains of the bridge were swinging like a hammock now, its single strand due to snap at any moment. Chandra, who was walking beside Biff, touched his arm. The rope, Biff, he said in a low voice. Somebody cut it. Biff stared at him. Are you sure? he gasped. When Chandra nodded, Biff said soberly, then that means there's an enemy right in our own party. That evening, when they had pitched their tents in the shelter of some trees on the rim of a rugged valley, Charles Keane remarked, Losing a few packs didn't hurt us because we were short on porters anyway. Short on porters? inquired Barma Shah. How? We had sixty yesterday morning, but there were only fifty-four when I counted them as they crossed the log bridge. That's why I brought up the rear, to see that no more of them skipped. That news brought a grim expression to Barma Shah's face. In response, he said, They may have heard our talk of Yeti. What is more, I saw some big tracks in the snow before we broke camp yesterday. 
I have literated them, but perhaps some of the porters saw them first. That night it snowed again, though only lightly. In the morning Biff awoke to hear the camp babbling with excitement. He crawled from his sleeping bag and emerged from the tent, where he promptly ran into Chandra, who told him, Yeti tracks again. Hurdu found them on the hill. Biff joined Charles Keane and Barma Shah up near some barren rocks. The tracks were much larger than a man's foot, but clumsy and roughly formed. They led in from the rocks, then back again, as though some creature had come down from the craggy hill toward the camp, only to return to its lair. Some of the Ladakhi bearers were gabbing among themselves and repeating, Yeti, Yeti, much too often, as they walked along beside the big footprints and compared them with their own smaller tracks. Back at camp, Barma Shah conferred with Ticks, who gave the porters a pep talk in a mixture of Hindi and Ladakhi. They responded in grunts of half agreement as they gathered up their packs. Those sound like yak grunts, declared Chuba. Good and bad. They don't want to go along, but anyway, they go. That is right, stated Chandra, who had caught the meaning of the speech. Tick says they have to go along because they can't go back as there is no bridge across the gorge. That night, the porters pitched their tents much closer together when they camped. There was another light snow, and in the morning, Herdu found new yeti tracks beside a rocky slope nearby. Charles Keane was frankly sceptical about them. Anybody could have made them with a piece of brushwood, Biff's uncle declared, or in half a dozen other ways, but I guess Tix can't convince his crowd of that. Tix thinks they are yeti tracks himself, returned Barma Shah. That is the real trouble. All day the Ladakhi porters kept watching the barren ground above the tree line, for that was the high altitude at which the yeti supposedly dwelled. They quickened their pace and reached the next campsite well before dusk. There trouble seemed over, for this was a valley where two trails crossed, and already a nomadic tribe was camped there. They greeted the party from Leh and gladly sold them fresh provisions. That night there was music and mirth around the campfires. The morning dawned crisp but pleasant, for there was no sign of any snow. Nor was there any sign of ticks or his Ladakhi porters. They had pulled out at dawn, taking the other trail the long way back to Leh, leaving only Herdu and a dozen others who were not Ladakhi. That automatically promoted Herdu to chief guide, and when he suggested hiring some of the nomad tribesmen as porters, Barma Shah favoured the idea, but asked for approval from Charles Keane as joint leader of the expedition. Biff's uncle was all for Herdu's suggestion. They look to me like Sherpas, he declared, like those friendly chaps we met in the valley where we landed our plane. They are not Sherpas, put in Chuba politely. I listen to their talk, Sahib Keen. They call themselves Changpas. They do not come from the south, but from the north. That means they are not Nepalese, stated Barma Shah, but Tibetans. They are accustomed to these high altitudes perhaps better than those who live in Ladakh or Nepal. What is more, he lowered his voice, they have probably heard less about the Yeti. Then let's hire them quickly, returned Charles Keane, with a knowing smile, before they can change their minds. Herdu hired the Changpa bearers, and the march was resumed. But the nomads, though sturdier than the old crew from Leh, lacked their steady-going qualities. They paused frequently to rest and eat, even hinting that they might drop their packs and quit. So Barma Shah told Herdu, to cut the day's trek short as soon as they reached a suitable campsite. That went on for three days, which pleased Biff and the other boys, as it gave them more time to roam at large. They had found little to talk about with the porters from Leh, but this Changpa crew were mostly hunters. They had brought throwing spears as well as bows and arrows, and at every halt they let the boys try the weapons. On the fourth morning, Biff awoke to find more snow on the ground. Nobody else was up, for the carefree Changpas were late risers. Glancing off beyond the camp, Biff saw something that riveted him. Going back into the tent, Biff wakened the nearest boy. 
who happened to be Chandra. Motioning for silence, Biff whispered, Yeti tracks, come on. Chandra came, bringing his trusty hand axe. Biff nodded approval and promptly borrowed a throwing spear that was standing outside a Changpa tent. He then led Chandra to the first of the marks that he had noticed in the snow. They looked like footprints and big ones, half the size of snowshoe tracks. Breathless, Chandra gestured back toward the camp. Maybe we better call others. Not yet, returned Biff. Let's see where these lead. Then we can plan ahead before everybody gets excited. The tracks led up the slope, but instead of ending there, they followed a snow-covered ledge. Beyond that was a huge, chunky rock, and as Biff glanced in that direction, he saw a great tawny figure with a shock of thick black hair as it bounded from cover. Then it was gone among another cluster of rocks. Biff was after it, beckoning Chandra along, and they saw the thing again as it sprang to another snowy ledge. There it dropped to all fours, and by the time the boys reached the ledge, it was gone again, but its footprint showed in the patchy snow. The two boys passed a slight turn where the rocks rose like jagged steps, tufted with snow. As Chandra started in that direction, Biff noticed an arched gap in the jagged wall that rose beside the ledge itself. Biff turned and called, Wait, Chandra, there's a cave here. Maybe that's where he went. Chandra looked back and his face froze with horror. He was too startled even to shout a warning, but the look in his eyes, which were staring straight past Biff, told enough. Instinctively, Biff wheeled about, then recoiled as he turned his eyes upwards. From the cleft in the rocky wall loomed a tremendous hulk of reddish-brown. Tiny eyes were glaring above wide-open, long-toothed jaws, while massive, sharp-clawed paws clamped downward, inward, toward the boy's dodging form. Biff Brewster was all but in the grip of a gigantic Tibetan bear, one of the most dangerous creatures that roved those rocky heights. End of chapter 17 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 18 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 18 The Frozen Waterfall All that saved Biff at that moment was the Changa spear that he had snatched from outside a tent. He had the weapon in his hand, and as he dodged, he jabbed the spear point at the creature from the cave. It was puny compared to the bear's bulk, but it bothered the big beast. Clumsily, the bear batted aside the jabs, and that diverted its action. Biff now had time to dive away. He flung the spear as he went, but it flew wide. Hardly had it clattered on the rocks before another weapon whizzed past the bear's head. Chandra's hand axe. Like Biff, Chandra timed his throw too late. The bear was already dropping on all fours, about to lope after Biff. Biff saw that in a glance and began thinking fast. Bears, though clumsy, could move swiftly and would attack if angered, which this one evidently was. Tibetan bears were death on yaks and sheep. That Biff had also heard. Maybe they'd keep coming after them on ledges like this, so there was no use acting like a sheep or a yak. Biff halted suddenly and flattened himself against the rocky wall, ready to reverse direction if the bear came bounding past. On the contrary, if it reared, Biff intended to be off again, and while waiting that moment of decision, he took a quick look down toward the campsite. That proved smart indeed. Instead of the area being all but deserted with everyone asleep, it literally teemed with action. Uncle Charlie and Barma Shah were coming up the slope armed with rifles and followed by half a dozen Changpa tribesmen, all with bows and arrows. All the other boys were coming too, apparently shouting as loudly as they could, but the wind was against them, which was why Biff hadn't heard them. They were gesturing, though, and that he understood. Wildly, all were waving for him to keep going along the ledge. That Biff would have done anyway, for just now the bear had arrived and was rearing for another lunge. So Biff took off again, hoping that the ledge would lead somewhere. That wasn't necessary. From behind him came the ping of bullets as they hit the ledge, followed by the boom of the actual gunshots from below. 
Biff darted another quick look and saw arrows coming down from the sky, with the rearing bear as their target. The bear hadn't budged from its last position, except to set itself up for the marksman. Suddenly, bristling with arrows, it toppled, rolled sideways and fell from sight over the ledge. Everybody took credit for the kill, which they had a right to do. Uncle Charlie had fired half a dozen shots and was sure that at least two had landed. Farmer Shah quietly showed Biff his rifle, which still had a special gadget fitted above the barrel. This time, Barma Shah confided, it was a telescopic sight. I only used the flashlight beam at night. As for the Changfa marksmen, there were six of them, and there were six arrows in the dead bear. They knew which arrow was whose, because all had identifying marks. They chattered among themselves, each claiming that his shaft had been the best. They were still at it after their comrades had carved the bear into stakes for the evening dinner at the next campsite. That pleased Barma Shah because nobody was interested in the Yeti tracks any more. He mentioned this fact to Hurdu, who interpreted it to the Changpas thus. You see what fools the Ladakhi are? Day after day they see tracks in the snow and think they are Yeti footprints. Instead they are just bear tracks. The big bear followed, hoping people have yaks that bear can kill and eat. Instead, people kill bear and eat it. But people who kill bear are Shangpas, not Ladaki. When they stopped for a noonday meal, the Changpa bowman was still arguing whose arrow had killed the big bear. While the other boys were watching and quietly getting a wallop out of the pantomime, Chandra drew Biff aside and asked, Who do you think really killed the bear? Uncle Charlie fired a lot of shots, replied Biff, and he may have made some hits. After all, we didn't dig the bullets out of the carcass. But I know, and you know, that Barma Shah is a terrific marksman. This is true, interposed Chandra, but Barma Shah did not kill the bear. The Yeti did. Biff stared, amazed. We saw a Yeti, said Chandra, didn't we? We saw something go hopping up to the ledge, conceded Biff, but when we got there, out popped the big bear. From the cave, yes, but I saw Yeti keep going up by rocks above. So you said, Chandra, but are you sure? Sure I am sure, because the number at one shot that killed the bear, it came from up there. Afterward, there was much shooting, but first the bear had gone like this. Chandra gave a perfect imitation of the way the bear had stiffened on the cliff, so Biff decided not to argue it. You may be right, he told Chandra, but let's keep it to ourselves. The Yeti is supposed to be right smart, maybe more man than ape, but to class him as an expert rifleman, well, people just wouldn't go for it. You go for it, Biff? I might go for anything, Chandra. Biff let it go at that, because his own recollections of what had happened on the ledge were somewhat confused, so he could allow for a few mistakes on Chandra's part. Besides, there was more important things to think about. The most important of all was brought up in an odd way when they pitched camp late that same afternoon. Biff heard Lee and Kamuka begin one of their old arguments while the other boys gleefully listened in. Well, Kamuka, commented Lee in an indulgent tone, now that you're high in the Himalayas, how do the Andes stack up? Still bigger, returned Kamuka. Anyway, they look bigger. That's what's most important. Kamuka looked for someone to agree, and he received an approving nod from Chuba. But there are things here that you won't find in the Andes, Lee went on. For instance, he caught himself when Biff gave him a warning glance. Instead of mentioning yetis, Lee made a quick switch. For instance, we have llamas. You don't have people like that in the Andes. Sure we do, rejoined Kamuka, only they don't look like people. They look like yaks. That brought a laugh from Biff in which Mike joined. Chandra and Chuba were still puzzled, so Biff explained. Lee means a llama spelled with one L like Lee. The llamas are important people. We are on our way to see one now. But Kamuka is talking about llamas spelled with a double L. They are animals that carry packs in the Andes as yaks do here. 
Biff left it to Mike to go into further details on the subject while he went over to talk to Uncle Charlie and Barma Shah. Biff put a simple question. How are we going to find Chauncey? Biff asked them. When will we hear from the Grand Lama, the wisest man in the East? I don't know, began Barma Shah, unless... His eyes narrowed as he spoke. He was looking off towards the nearest mountain pass, and Biff, following his gaze, saw a tiny figure coming toward them at a jog trot. What is it? Biff asked anxiously. Not, not a yeti? No, no, Barma Shah had raised a pair of binoculars and was studying the approaching man. It is a long umper, a special kind of runner, who carries messages from one lama to another. A long umper can keep up that pace all day. And he may have a message for us? Very possibly. The rangy long umper never slackened speed until he pulled into the camp. There, in some uncanny fashion, he picked out the leaders of the party. But when he approached Barma Shah and Charles Keene, he did not hand them the envelope he carried. Instead, he gave it to Biff. Then, with a faraway stare, the runner started off again, oblivious to everything, including the weather. For despite the freezing temperature, he wore only a simple goatskin and a pair of open sandals. Biff opened the envelope and brought out a sheet of parchment which proved to be a map. He showed it to Uncle Charlie and Barma Shah. Together, they studied it in the firelight, for it was now dusk. The map puzzled them completely until Charles Keane declared, I don't get it. Somebody has drawn what looks like a streak of lightning. That's it, the place of living thunder, Barma Shah exclaimed. He brought out another map and spread it in the firelight. It showed the whole course that the party had followed. Near the present campsite was a zigzag line, exactly like the one on the parchment, but on a smaller scale. It is a chasm a mile deep, explained Barma Shah, but only half that distance across. Nobody has ever gone there because it is supposed to be impassable. He traced a dotted line on the long umpers chart. It must lead to the lost city of Chauncey. No wonder no one has ever found it. We'll start for there tomorrow. They were off to an early start the next morning and soon were among scenes of grandeur that surpassed any so far encountered. Narrow valleys filled with odd, colourful flowers formed a contrast to the snow-topped peaks that loomed high above. Then abruptly the trail reached the brim of a deep granite-walled canyon. Nearby was a cluster of trees indicated on the parchment map. A dotted line began from there, so the party moved into the grove. There they were halted by a big rock until the boys probed the underbrush around it and found stone steps leading downward. Soon the whole procession was following a dizzy trail chiseled into the canyon wall. Barma Shah had been right regarding its depth. It was at least a mile and perhaps more. The vast gulch followed a zigzag as shown on the map, and as they steadily descended, the brim of the gorge was totally lost from view due to the narrowing of the walls. Then the zigzag sharpened, and on their own side of the gorge they saw a fascinating sight. Through an opening in the granite poured what looked like a mammoth waterfall, except that it was utterly motionless. At the bottom, half a mile beneath, was a vast, glassy mass, pockmarked by thousands of huge stones. An icefall, exclaimed Charles Keane, a stream of water, frozen solid, pouring down to a glacier below. As he spoke, they saw a chunk of ice and rock drop from the brink and slide out along the graceful frozen curve until it dropped straight down and struck the glacier. Then came a rising echo that reverberated through the gorge like a long roll of thunder. When the sound finally died away, Barma Shah said coolly, that is why they call it the place of living thunder. People have heard that roar from the brink above, but we are the first to see what caused it, except for those who live in the valley. Their course brought them to the huge ice ball. This time Charles Keane and Barma Shah led the way together, followed by Herdu and Tibetan bearers, with Biff and the boys bringing up the rear. The path seemed a very safe one, being hewn in the solid rock. Granite steps took them upward to the overhanging curve of the giant icefall. Above that, a bridge of large stepping stones crossed the whitish flowing mass. 
Biff, in the lead, leaped to the first stone and felt it quiver. He should have turned back, but instead he tried to jump onto the next. The first stone suddenly went from under him, spilling Biff backward. Mike, who had reached the top of the steps, grabbed for Biff's hand and caught it with both of his own. Then Mike was swept off balance by the force of Biff's slide. Both would have gone skimming over the brink, except that Chuba and Kamuka, coming next, were in time to catch Mike's ankles and hold them. They hadn't the strength to pull the pair back, and Biff, from his precarious position, realised why. That curving brink of perpetual ice was so smooth that it offered nothing in the way of a hold, not even the slightest amount of friction. Slowly, surely, the drag would bring all four along, unless someone's hold gave out. In any case, Biff Brewster would be the first to slide out over that fatal curve and plunge the half-mile to the glacier below. End of chapter 18 Recording by Peter Tomlinson